From Cross Culture Church in Raleigh, this is Crosswalk. Whether it's fear of heights, fear of snakes, or fear of something else, we all know what fear feels like. But what about fear that keeps you from being all that God wants you to be? Now that's scary. We're kicking off a short but very important series entitled Fear Factor. Spiritual fear is a sickness that has symptoms that you and I need to recognize. Thanks for joining us. Now here's Pastor Clay. We are... Uh, starting a brand new series today, and I'm so excited to be here. I, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, after all the years I've been doing ministry, I still get excited to get to do what I get to do, and I'm so excited to be here today, and I'm excited that you're here today. Thanks for being here today, and I pray that when you go out the doors today, that you'll be able to say, or that sometime in the afternoon, at some point it will strike you, I pray that when you go out of here today, you will be able to say, I'm glad I was there. Yeah, he may have been glad I was there, but I'm glad I was there. I'm glad I had the opportunity to go uh, into the house of the Lord, to worship him, to, to open his word, to see what he has to say. My prayer for you always is, is that you'll be able to go out of here saying that, you know what, that wasn't a waste of my time. That, wasn't, that was profitable for me and... I was glorifying God in obedience by coming into his house uh, and just worshiping him today. So uh, that's, that's almost always at least some part of my prayer for you. I pray for you all uh, on a regular basis. Pray for our children. Pray for the adults. Pray for whatever stage of life you're in. Many of you, uh, oftentimes I'm speaking your name by name to the Lord in and, and certain situations I may know about and that sort of thing. Some things I don't always know about, but I know that... Um, that life is tough, and there's always stuff about life that can be hard, right? And so we're going to do this little uh, mini-series entitled Fear Factor. Fear Factor. I was thinking about it. They, they really, they had, somebody had to come up with a TV show uh, based on that. It seemed like it would be, might be pretty successful. Fear Factor, a short series uh, that we're going to look at, and obviously the name may make the the idea or the topic uh, self-evident, uh, but we're going to talk some about it as we uh, go this morning. Thank you for being here. Well, this August will be four years uh, since I had a motorcycle accident. Some of you know about that, some of you don't know about that. Four years ago I had a motorcycle accident uh, myself and Ed Alexander and Steve Pierce, uh, another uh, pastor. We were uh, driving some back roads and going uh, through a small little town, heading up to uh, ride the Blue Ridge Parkway for the weekend. And our wives were go driving up separately, going up the interstate, and we were looking forward uh, to that. And along the way, uh, going through a little town, a young lady was coming in the opposite direction, and she was texting and she never looked up, and she slammed into the back of a car that was preparing to turn and uh, just careened that car into my lane as I was coming in the opposite direction, and it was just, it was instantaneous, and I was doing 45, 50 miles an hour, and she was, they estimated she was doing at least that. She hit it, and collision. You know, one of the interesting things about the accident is I do not ever remember being afraid, being fearful, having fear in the action. I remember the instant of contact. I remember uh, excruciating pain instantly in, in from my knee down. I remember flying through the air, landing, tumbling. I, I remember audibly my grunts as I was rolling around. I remember laying there on the ground, and I remember hearing people yell, uh, move him, it's on fire, that my motorcycle had kind of come to rest by me, and somebody else yelling, you can't move him, he's injured, and uh, I remember that, but I don't remember being afraid. I remember Steve Pierce, and some of you that know Steve Pierce, uh, he's pastoring another church now, but uh, he's from South Africa, and I can remember uh, looking up, and he's standing over me, he's look, look, standing over me, saying, it'll be all right, pasta, it's going to be all right, pasta, you're going to be all right, pasta. And I remember thinking, that's easy for you to say. No, I, I didn't really think that. But I, re I, remember, I remember that. But I don't remember being fearful. When they put me in the ambulance, I remember, and I was in and out, right? Okay? But I remember the ambulance 
man guy that was taking care of me, EMT. Is that right, EMT? I remember him radioing the hospital, and I remember hearing him say, probable amputation. But I don't remember being fearful. I do remember in that instant saying to myself, okay, this is life-changing. But I, re I don't remember being fearful. I don't remember being fearful when this little, I mean, she looked like she was 12. She was a surgeon, this young lady, woke me up in the ER. She, she's shaking me, waking me. I remember her shaking me and waking me and saying, uh, Mr. Stevens, Mr. Stevens, I need you to wake up and sign this so I can amputate your finger. And I, I remember thinking, oh, <laughs> but I don't remember being afraid about that. Now, at times, I kind of wish I'd have woke up and argued with her a little bit because I kind of miss that little extra half an inch when I'm trying to reach guitar chords and stuff. But, but I, I don't remember being fearful. I remember a lot of nights for a month in the hospital. I remember a lot of nights of pain. I remember Cindy being there with me. I, know, I remember a lot of praying and pain and singing and stuff like that. But I don't remember being fearful. Until... The day they said I could go home. Now, they said, because of the extent of my injuries and all the stuff, that I would have to go by ambulance, and this was in Winston-Salem Hospital by ambulance, back to Raleigh. Insurance had already told us that, that, that insurance would not cover it because that wasn't an emergency ambulance ride. And so I don't remember what it was, like $800 or $1,200 or something like the ambulance cost was going to be. We just... We just we don't have that kind of money to spend on an, on an ambulance. So somehow, we talked the doctor into letting Cindy drive me home in the back of her little Toyota Camry that she had. And uh, I, I wish y'all could have been a fly on the wall to see how hilarious it was getting me into the back of that Camry. Because I was in a wheelchair, I couldn't, you know, my leg is all what it was. And I remember getting in there and, you know, crammed my head was like up against the corner of the thing just so they could get the door closed from my leg sticking out, you know, the way it was. But we got in there and so we were ready to go home. And I was ready to go home. After a month in the hospital, I was ready to go home. But the first time I felt fear was when we got out there on the interstate heading home. And I was, maybe petrified is a bit too strong of a word. But I, I was scared. All of a sudden, all of these cars beside me, and, and, all, uh, and, I, and I'm sure I was doing a lot of backseat driving uh, back there. <laughs> but, but that was the first time I could remember feeling fear. And I would have been perfectly fine if my wife had said, you know what, I'll just pull over and park. We'll, 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 just, we'll just stay here the rest of our lives <laughs> on the side of I-40. And I, I, I probably would have been perfectly okay with that because I was, and I know it's all the trauma of the accident. And it took, it took a long time for me to get, any time I went out in a car after that, it took a long time for me to get comfortable with people being beside me, coming the other direction, and all this kind of stuff. The first time I really felt fear over the whole thing. Fear made me feel like I, I, I don't want to move. I, I just want to stay right here. Today, I want to tell you about a group of people who let the same thing happen to them because of fear. They didn't want to move forward. And I want to share with you how that, how that cost them. Now, let me say this. I'm very grateful for all of the, the assistance, the doctors, the surgery. They, they saved my Obviously, they didn't. It's not amputated. It's, it's still there. Yeah, it's, uh, I only lost a pretty little bit of finger, but uh, I'm grateful for those doctors and what they, what they did. Today, I want to talk to you kind of from the perspective of a doctor because I want to describe some symptoms to you. Now, most of you know I am not a medical doctor, and I don't play one on TV, but I do want to share with you. <laughs> That's right. I stayed at Holiday Inn Express last night. That's right. And I want to share with you some symptoms of fear. And, and next week you'll under, may perhaps understand more clearly why we need to look at the symptoms and understand the symptoms first. Because next week we'll get to the prescription 
for fear. But, but I want to talk to you about fear, and I'm referring specifically to fear in the context of the kingdom of God and moving forward with God and moving forward in what God wants for your life, what God wants for this church. Uh, the, what, what is fear? How does fear affect us in, in the plans and the opportunities that God has for us, for our families, uh, for our church, all of those kind of things. So if you have a copy of God's Word with you, you can open it to Deuteronomy chapter 1 uh, this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 1, I'm going to be uh, jumping into the middle of the story, but I will give you the context in just a moment. The text will be up on the screen as well, but I encourage you, open a copy of God's Word, whether yours is electronic, uh, digital, whether it's hard copy uh, like mine. Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1. Are we there? I'm going to read the text as we go through this morning because of the length of it. But I'm going to share these four symptoms to, with you of fear. And, and we'll talk to him about it as we go. Okay? Y'all ready? All right? Glad you're here? All right. I want you to be able to say that when you leave today. All right. Here's the first symptom that we're looking at this morning. Fear causes paralysis. That is a symptom of fear. It will cause paralysis in your life. Let me read it from uh, ver- starting in verse 20 of Deuteronomy chapter 1. I said to you, you have come to the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is about to give us. See, the Lord your God has placed the land before you. Go up, take possession, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has spoken to you. Do not fear or be dismayed. And then all of you approached me and said, Let us send men before us that they may search out the land for us and bring back to us word of the way by which we should go up and the cities which we shall enter. The thing pleased me. And I took twelve of your men, one man for each tribe. Hey, pray with me uh, this morning. Father, uh, today as we dive into this story, as we look at your word, I'm praying for application Uh, to each person's life. I do not know the particular fears that each person deals with in their life that affect them and impact their life when it comes to following your will and moving forward in this journey that we are called to with you. But I pray that you would use the power of your word, which is quick and alive, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, It's able to divide soul and spirit, even joint and marrow. I pray that you would use your word as a skilled surgeon, God, that you would use your word to cut out of our lives the fears that do not belong and sow into our lives the things we need to live without fear and move forward in our journey of faith. God, thank you for each person who is here Now, take your word and apply it to each person's heart and life in this room and those who perhaps who will listen or or watch this message later. In Jesus' name, amen. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, Moses is recounting an event. He's giving a history lesson. A history lesson of an event that occurred in the past. Forty years in the past. uh, Moses is using this lesson to teach the Israelites about trusting God and overcoming fears in their lives. And so he begins to tell them this story of when God brought the Israelites to the to the the gateway, if you will, into the promised land, the, the, the event that they're about to come into, this, this place that they've, they've heard about and it's been talked about and been promised to them for years and years, for literally for hundreds of years. They're there and they are at that moment. Now, interestingly enough, this account is also uh, told to us in, um, in uh, Numbers chapter 13, I think is where it is, uh, we, where we find the event as well, or Exodus 13, maybe it is. Anyway, in, in that account, we find out that uh, we, we hear Moses say that God commanded him or told him, send the spies in. 
But here in Deuteronomy 1, we find out that it was actually the people's idea to send the spies in. God simply said, Moses, if that's what they want, send the spies in. Here's something, listen, you you may or may not want to hear this, but the truth is God will let us do things that can be harmful to ourselves. God will let us do things that can be destructive. God will let us do things that are out of his will. If that sounds kind of scary to you, I'm sorry. There are simply too many biblical examples of it where, where we find people doing something that was contrary to God's will. That doesn't mean... That there, that there won't be a cost to stepping out of God's will. And it certainly doesn't mean that God is not in control. Listen to me. You may do things. I may do things in my life that are not God's will for my life, but you are never out of God's control. God is always ahead of everything that goes on in our life. And in the other text, we find out that God says... Moses, send them in. But here in Deuteronomy 1, to find out that it was the people who said, hey, how about if we send in spies? Because here they are. As we just read, they're, they're, Moses said, uh, we were at the brink of the promised land, and I, and, I, and I said to you then, you meaning the nation of Israel, 40 years earlier, I said, look at this, here's this land. God's given us this land. It's time to go up. It's time to take this land. Sorry, I just gave Joe Thomas a heart attack. But <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know what's causing it, but um, it's time to go, go into the promised land. (laughs) Now, now hold on a minute, Moses. Listen, God promises this land a long time. He promises to our forefathers hundreds of years ago. I mean, there's no sense in getting a rush about this. Hey, what do you think if we send in a reconnaissance team ahead of us? You know, they can go in, they can, they, can, they can scout out maybe the best way to get into the land. They can tell us some things about the, the cities and, and, and where we should go and, and that sort of thing. Now, what do you think we just send in a reconnaissance team? Sounds pretty reasonable, doesn't it? It obviously sounded reasonable uh, to, to Moses because in verse 23 it said, Moses said, the thing pleased me, that pleased me. When it, said that. it sounded reasonable. It's not not like a a rational idea. Here's the problem, though, ladies and gentlemen. God doesn't ask us to walk by reason. God asks us to walk by faith. The Bible doesn't say without reason it's impossible to please God. The Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. That doesn't mean that reason is a bad thing. That doesn't mean that our belief system is not rational. That doesn't mean that there's not empirical evidence for the existence of God and the validity of the Scriptures and the resurrection of Christ and all of those things. It doesn't mean that reason is a bad thing. Reason's not a bad thing, except except when it interferes with a faith action that God is asking us to take. That's when reason gets in the way. When it keeps us from moving forward in a faith action that God has asked us to take. And in this moment, the Israelites froze. They're like deer in the headlights, froze. That's what fear will do. It will cause paralysis. The inability to move forward in your life. A number of years ago, I was on an airplane with a friend of mine, uh, Mike Byer. Some of you would, would remember Mike. He used to live in Raleigh-Durham area. And we were going to a, a mission conference, Global Priority Mission Conference in Nashville, Tennessee. And we were sitting on the airplane on the tarmac at RDU. And we were sitting there for a pretty good while, and the plane had not taken off. And in a few moments, we understood why. The pilot comes on the intercom. I, I don't know if I can make this sound like pilots do this is just... <laughs> sorry that was a little loud let's what check, what check that uh ladies and gentlemen uh this is pilot from the flight deck uh well sorry for the delay uh, it looks like we got a couple of o-rings boogered up on one of the engines uh we'll have those parts here pretty soon and get it repaired and we'll be on our way thanks for your patience 
Now, I don't know what technical manual the pilot got the term boogered up out of. But I turned to Mike Byers and said, in the O-rings, the thing that failed and caused the space shuttle to explode into a billion pieces? I have to be honest with you. In that moment, I didn't want to go anywhere. <laughs> I was just fine staying right there on the ground. You know what? That's understandable. If you're sitting on an airplane loaded with jet fuel that's about to take off and go 30,000 feet in the air with you in it, and your pilot has just told you you got a couple of boogered up O-rings, <laughs> it might be understandable that, that, there, that there might be a desire to just stay right where you are. But listen to me. When God Almighty says, hey guys, it's time to move out, it's time to move out. It's time to move when God says, move. Fear will cause paralysis. It'll cause you to just, oh no, I can't. Oh, what is this? Oh, what about that? Oh, I don't know. That's what fear will do to you. I just preached on this a few weeks ago, but you remember the story in uh, 1 Samuel 17 where David faces Goliath? Uh, do you remember before David gets there? Uh, Goliath comes out every day and, he, and he, he says to the to the Israeli army, he says, hey, hey, I tell you what, you guys send your best man over to fight against me. Which is, by the way, why it was such an insult to Goliath when this young kid comes running across there with nothing but a slingshot in his hand. Hey, send your best man over to fight with me. If he wins, we'll, the Philistines will serve you. But if I win, y'all will serve us. And it says there in 1 Samuel 17, what he says is, When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Isn't that interesting? It's almost the exact same phrase that Moses uses to describe the nation of Israel when he, when, when he said, All right, guys, it's time to, to move into the promised land. It's time to, to get going. You're going to find it's almost the exact same phrase that he says that, that no, oh, 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 maybe, well, maybe we better hold up. Maybe we better scout it out. But maybe we better, listen, that's what, that's what I'm saying to you. That's a symptom of fear. You have to understand it. Fear for what God wants for your life. It will cause paralysis in your life. I want to ask you a question uh, this morning uh, before we move on. Has fear, ask yourself this question, has fear kept me from moving forward in God's plan for my life? I just want you to think about that in the context of your own life and where you are and what's going on, just to ask yourself that question. Has fear kept me from moving forward in God's plan for my life? It's, it's an honest evaluation I need to look at. Because, because we can say, oh, I, I don't, I don't, well, I don't. Paralysis, that's a symptom of fear. Here's a second uh, symptom of fear. Fear causes bad eyesight. It's going to pick it up in verse 24. Look at this. And they turned and went up into the hill country and came to the valley of Eskel and spied it out. And then they took some of the fruit of the land in their hands and they brought it down to us and they brought us back a report and said, Oh, it is a good land which the Lord our God has, is, is about to give us. Verse 26, Yet you were not willing to go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God, and you grumbled in your tents and said, Because the Lord hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go up? Our brethren have, have made our hearts melt saying the people are bigger and taller than we are. The cities are, are large and fortified to heaven. And besides, we saw the sons of the Anakim there, giants, those of large stature, large size. Fear will cause bad eyesight. As I said, this is the promise, man. This is the moment. Hundreds of years in the making. All right? Now think about this. The Israelites have spent 400 years in captivity. 400 years in captivity in Egypt. They finally come out. They're at that moment. They send in the spies, and the spies bring back fruit from their reconnaissance mission. 
it, they bring back, a, a matter of fact, a, in the, the text in, in Numbers 13, it says that the, the grapes that they brought back, they brought back one bunch of grapes. And it was so big that they had to put it on a pole uh, for, and carry it between two men on the shoulders. That's a serious bunch of grapes. Make a lot of raisin bran from that. Or whatever else you would do with them grapes. A lot of Welch's grape juice. That's what they make with it. And it says they brought back figs and they brought back pomegranates. I mean, this, this literally is this land flowing with milk and honey. It's, 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 it's been planted and it's just, that's unbelievable. And there are these cities, that, magnificent cities and these homes and all of this stuff. And it's all right there for the taking. And God says, go in. But they couldn't see it. In that moment, they couldn't see it. All they could see was, oh, oh, we can't go up. God's brought us out here to die at the hands of the Amorites. Oh, they're bigger than we are. Oh, their cities are fortified to the heavens. Oh, there's giants in that land. We can't take it. Oh, oh. By the way, do you know that's the only thing they actually got accurate? They weren't right, but they... They were accurate. They were accurate when they said they couldn't take the land, but they weren't right because God never asked them to take the land. God said, I'll go before you and I'll fight for you. You just have to go up and take the land. But they couldn't see it. All this good and they couldn't see it. All they could see was the bad. That's what fear will do for you. It will cause bad eyesight. I was reading this story. Uh, about a gentleman, uh, Alan Emery was his name. He was in the wool business. And Alan Emery had the opportunity to go and spend the night with a shepherd out on the Texas Plains. This was a number of years ago. And he said that night uh, out as they uh, had made a camp and had a fire going, that night uh, you could hear from time to time the, the long wail of uh, coyotes, uh, not what sounded like not very far from them, the coyotes wail. And he said the shepherd's dogs would, would start growling and they would peer out into the, to the darkness. And he said the shepherd got up and he, he took some logs and he put some more logs on the fire and caused the fire to, to come up brighter and to, and to glow brighter. And when he did, Alan Emery says he saw what looked like thousands of lights all around him. And he realized that the thousands of lights were reflections of the fire in the eyes of the sheep. And he said it struck him in that moment. That in their moment of fear, they weren't looking out into the darkness at what was fearful to them. They were looking toward their source of help and rescue. They were looking to their shepherd. And Al Emery said in that moment he couldn't help but think of Hebrews chapter 12 that says, let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus on whom our faith depends from beginning to end. Listen, here, here, here's the question for you today. Where are you looking in those moments of fear in your life when God is beginning to move on your life, to move forward? Maybe, maybe, maybe it's a, f- a friend or a neighbor that, that does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ and God is is burdening your heart, he's speaking to you, and you know it. He's calling you to move out, to try and share your faith with this, with this person. And instead of seeing the good that can come from it, all you can see is the bad. All you can see is, oh, he, he, he's, he's going to get mad at me. Oh, he's going to be angry at me. Oh, he's going he's to reject me. He's never going to want to have anything to do with me. You see, that's what, that's what fear will do. It will cause bad eyesight. Israel was at this moment, they're ready to go into this land, this bountiful land. By the way, let me just say this before we move on. If, if perhaps you're thinking, well, that doesn't seem right, that Israel should get to just move into this land with that's all this harvested, all this stuff is ready to eat, and all, all this grain and all this kind of stuff, and, and all these cities and these homes. Are all, it doesn't seem right that Israel gets to move in uh, where all these people have, have, have done all this work. If you're sitting there thinking that, can I just say this to you? Why don't you understand this? It wasn't their land. It didn't belong to them. It didn't belong to those people. 
Hundreds of years before this event, God had promised it to Abraham and to his descendants. It was his land to give, and he gave it to Abraham, and he gave it to his descendants. The Amorites and and all the others were stealing land that didn't belong to them. And in the moment when when God had prepared it for them, when he he had let this land be developed and come to what it was, and and it was going to fulfill the promise, they couldn't see it. All they could see was the bad. That's what fear will do to you. Here's a third symptom this morning. Fear will cause amnesia. Sure will. Watch now, verse 29. Then I said to you, Moses is saying, this is what I said to your parents 40 years ago. Then I said to you, do not be shocked, nor fear them, The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight on your behalf just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you just as a man carries his son in all the way which you have walked until you came into this place. Watch this, verse 32. But for all this you did not trust the Lord your God who goes before you on your way to seek out a place for you to encamp in fire by night and cloud by day to show you the way in which you should go. Suddenly, the Israelites get amnesia. And it's an epidemic. Virtually everyone in there, listen to me, has forgotten. They've forgotten what God had done for them time and time and time and time. Again, they forgot. That's what fear will do to you. It will cause amnesia. Moses said, hey, we're talking about the God who who brought you out of captivity. Remember all those miracles that he did down there? The, the, The plagues and all that, how to show himself strong, to bring you out so that Pharaoh would let you go? Remember that parting of the Red Sea so that you could escape the Egyptian army, the most powerful army on earth at that time? Remember that water that came from a rock? Remember that bread that fell from heaven? Remember those quail that just showed up every day for you to eat? Remember that pillar of of fire uh, that was around you at night to warm the camp and to protect you? Remember that pillar of, uh, of cloud that went before you during the day to shade you from the desert heat so that you wouldn't be overcome by the desert heat? Who did all of those things? God did. God did. But they forgot. They forgot. In that moment, fear caused amnesia. Some of y'all may remember the story of a young lady named Natalie Gilbert. Natalie Gilbert was invited to sing the national anthem at a Portland Trailblazers playoff game back in the early 2000s. Uh, Watch this video. And now to honor America and salute the men and women serving our country with our national anthem, please welcome, as voted by you, the fans, our winner of the Toyota Get the Feeling of a Star promotion, Natalie Gilbert. Let's 
Maurice Cheeks was the head coach of the Portland Trailblazers at that uh, time. He's the one that came over to help uh, Natalie out. Now, I'm not sure whether he actually helped her or hurt her because he was really kind of off tune there a little bit, <laughs> quite, quite a bit. But, uh, but you got to applaud his, his effort. And, and listen, I'm not, I'm not dissing on Natalie Gilbert. She was obviously a very talented young lady. But think about it. How many times had she sung that song before that moment? How many thousands of times had she rehearsed that song in the weeks leading up to the moment that she was going to sing it in front of all those people? She knew that song backwards and forwards. You know she did. What happened? One word, fear. Fear caused her to forget. Words that she easily knew, but in that moment, she forgot them. And I'm saying to you that that when we're talking about God's advancements and what he wants us to do in our individual lives, fear will cause us to forget what God has done in the past. When, when what we ought to be saying is, wait a minute, wait a minute, I don't have to be afraid of this. Remember when God did this? Remember how God stepped in in that situation? Remember how God made provision for this? What in the world have we got to be afraid of? But amnesia comes as a result of fear. When what we ought to be doing is maybe taking time to think and remember what God has done in the past. Israel, all these things, all these things that God had done for them, and they they forgot because of fear. It'll cause amnesia. And then one more thing that I want to share. Well, no, I'm good. Let me, I want to say that, Tyler. Let me, I, w- I want to say this, make the statement to you. Fear causes us to forget what God has done in the past will keep us from believing what he can do in the future. That, that's, that's exactly what I want to say to you. Fear that causes us to forget what God has done in the past will keep us from believing what God can do in the future. We have to be willing to remember what God has done. It's a key thing that God has given to us, to show himself strong so that you and I can say, no, wait a minute. I, I know the situation looks fearful, looks scary, but we can believe God. Here's one more I want to read to you this morning, and, it, and it's this. Fear causes back pain. Listen to this. Then the Lord, watch this. Then the Lord heard the sound of your words. Listen to that now. Because what, what were they doing? They're, they're in their tents. They're, they're shaking. Oh, we can't. Oh, what is God playing a trick on us? Oh, oh. I'm just telling you, you and I better keep that in mind. Then the Lord heard the sound of your words, and he was angry and took an oath, saying, Not one of these men... This evil generation shall see the good land which I swore to give your fathers, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. He shall see it, and to him and to his sons I will give the land on which he has set foot, because he has followed the Lord fully. The Lord was angry with me also on your account. (laughs) Moses. The Lord was also angry with me also on your account, saying, Not even you shall enter there. Moses apparently forgot that little episode where where he got upset and struck the rock. Anyway, not even you shall enter there. Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall enter there. Encourage him, for he will cause Israel to inherit it. Moreover, your little ones who you said would become a prey and your sons who said this day have no knowledge of good or evil shall enter there and I will give it to them and they shall possess it. But as for you... Watch this. Turn around. Set out for the wilderness by the way to the Red Sea. Oh, you mean that wilderness we we just had to come through? Turn around. Verse 41. Then you said to me, "We, we have sinned against the Lord. We will indeed go up and fight just as the Lord our God commanded us. And every man of you girded on his weapon of war and regarded it as easy to go up into the hill country. And the Lord said to me, say to them, do not go up nor fight, for I am not among you. Otherwise, you will be defeated before your enemies. So I spoke to you, but you would not listen. Instead, you rebelled against the command of the Lord and you acted presumptuously, went went up into the hill country. The Amorites who lived in that hill country came out against you and chased you as bees do and crushed you. 
from Seir to Hormah. And then you returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord did not listen to your voice nor give ear to you. So you remained in Kadesh many days, the days that you spent there. What was it there in verse 40? But as for you, turn around and set out for the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. There's the back pain. They had to go back to where they had been. And I can assure you that caused a great deal of pain for the people of Israel. Because they wouldn't believe, because they let fear cause them to freeze, to not see what God could do and the good that he had provided, to not remember what God had done for them in the past. So now, listen, this is a, this is a reality, folks. This is a reality check. God said, uh uh-uh. uh, stop right there. Turn around and go back. I've been promising you this land for hundreds and hundreds of years. I brought you to the very brink, ready to move you in to houses you did not build, cities you did not fortify, fields you did not cultivate, trees you did not grow. It's all yours. Go in and take it and you would not do it. Turn around. You got to go back. Listen to me. Listen to me. This is a good word for all of us. You might even want to write it in your Bibles. They died in the wilderness when they should have been living in the promised land. They died out there in the wilderness. Now, God still made provision for them. They were still his people. He was still going to be with them. But they died in the wilderness when they could have been living in the promised land. And listen, can I say this to you as well? I know that that sometimes in the things that God calls us to do, whether we're talking about individually or whether we're talking about as a church, I know sometimes the things that God calls us to do can look a little scary, can be a little fearful. But listen, I I would remind you of this. I'd bring this up also. Moving forward with God is a lot less scary than going back without him. I'm just telling you that right now. That's a truth I've learned in my life. Moving forward with God is a lot less scary than going back without him. They had to go back. And they were never able to, that that generation was never able to enter in to the promised land. And of course, once once that pronouncement is made, oh, oh, we've made a terrible mistake. Oh, we'll go up into the land. Sure, we'll we'll take it. We'll we'll go and do it now. Isn't it a weird thing that, that... that these Israelites, and we would never do anything like this, but we somehow muster up the strength when we, in ourselves to do it. But when God says do it, it's, oh, no. But, oh, okay, we may say, we'll go up, we'll take it. And God says to Moses, you better tell them people not to go up there because I am not with them. They're going to get their behinds kicked. Of course, they didn't listen to God. They didn't listen to him before. They didn't listen to him now. And they went up and they got their behinds kicked. That's what fear will do. It'll cause you some back pain. Oftentimes you have to go back because you're unwilling to move forward with God. I do not want you, I do not want this church, I do not want our families, our individual lives to experience the pain of having to go back because we're unwilling to move forward with God. This church, Cross Culture Church, everything about it is designed to help people move forward. The hope, the intent is to help people move forward in their journey with Christ, to walk on into what God has for them. Don't don't shrink back. Don't, Don't. Don't be afraid to the point that it keeps you from what God wants you to do in your life. Don't freeze like a deer in the headlights because it just looks, oh, oh, that looks scary. Sure, it's a scary world we live in. Don't do it. Remember who your God is. Look at what he's promising you and what is in front of you. Move forward in faith instead of cowering back in fear. And you'll, you'll be amazed at what God will do in your life, in my life, and in our lives. 
in the life of this church as we move into 2018 and on into the years of ministry that God uh, has for this church. We cannot shrink back because something looks scary or because there's an uncertain future about what will happen this and what about that and oh, when will we get a building or anything else. But to say what God calls us to do, we move out in faith and we move forward believing that God is big enough and strong enough, looking back at what he's done in the past and realizing, wait a minute, he did this, he, he handled that situation, he worked in that, he worked that out, he provided for this. What do we have to fear? Now the question becomes, how do I overcome my fear? Realizing it, we'll talk about that next week. Realizing it, okay, I, I see that in my life. How do I, how do I, I don't want fear to control my life. I would hope you would say that. I don't want fear to control my life. I don't want fear to keep me from what God has for me. So how do I overcome it? What's the prescription? Lord willing, we'll look at that next week. But understanding the symptoms, recognizing the symptoms is important for your life so that you can back up and say, whoa, mm, I, I shouldn't be paralyzed. I, I, shouldn't, my, I shouldn't be seeing only the bad and not, not what the good God and all that he has for me. I can't forget. I can't get amnesia and forget what God has done in the past. I gotta, I, I, I've got to move forward. I've got to do what God wants me to do. I, I can't go back. We'll talk about some of that next week and those, that prescription that we need. Israel was on the brink of a great victory. The promise that had been made hundreds of years before was about to be fulfilled, but fear caused them to fail. Of course, the same thing can happen in our lives. God is always leading us into new territory, always trying to take us farther in our spiritual walk with Him. As Pastor Clay explained in today's message, fear causes a host of symptoms. But as we also learned, God is the prescription for victory over all of our fears. We invite you to join us on a Sunday morning at Cross Culture Church. We gather each week in a casual and contemporary atmosphere to celebrate the goodness of our God. Cross Culture may be a little different from what you're thinking. Sure, we're a church, but instead of religion, we're about a relationship, a community of believers where Jesus is revealed in the lives of each person, real people who truly care, solid biblical teaching from Pastor Clay Stevens, and the most energetic, fun, and safe kids program around. Find out more at crossculture.church. I want to lead you to the cross. I want to lead you to the cross. Cross Culture Church in North Raleigh, taking the cross to our culture and taking our culture to the cross.